hospitality last night was fantastic, so thank you very much. I'm here to give you a bit of a patient perspective, so um, I hope you enjoy and I hope you learn something. And how many of you are going to be there later for my workshop? I hope to see you all, or as many of you as I can. Um, really, today I'm going to give you a bit of a mind-blowing way to improve patient relationships. That's the challenge I've set myself anyway. So I hope you enjoy. Now listen, in 2010, at 39, my drivers were my family. I was a huge outdoor enthusiast. We went to Cornwall every year for 14 years with the kids, surfing, so on. But I also used to be a big fell runner. When I say big runner, I put Forrest Gump to shame because I used to run 70 miles a week. Just between me and you, that was just to get away from the husband and kids. <laughs> anyway, um, what actually happened, you'll see later. But I just want to ask, uh, can you just raise your hands? If you had the unlikely option of either talking or walking, would you raise your hands if you'd rather walk or talk? Who would choose to talk? OK, quite a lot of you. OK. So what I'm going to, sorry, I'm just going to move on. What I'm going to ask you, what I'm going to show you now is something that happened to me on the 7th of February 2010. Bear in mind, I was this very fit young mother, 39 fell runner. Kate Allen from Dore in South Yorkshire had a severe brainstem stroke and then went on to develop locked-in syndrome. Doctors said she'd never walk or talk again. Mother of three defied their you know, it was a bit of a shock to everybody, you know, that someone my age, my fitness, could have had a stroke, a brainstem stroke at that. Um, in terms of the science, I had a right vertebral artery dissection, occlusion, and infarction of the pons. And if you look on Google, which I did at the nurse's station computer, big mistake, um, it's one of the worst brainstem strokes you can get. In actual fact, that's a picture of my brain now. And that big shadow by the white arrow shows the occlusion uh, from my brainstem stroke. So it was quite substantial. And the reason I've got it is because I did some research for UCL in London two years after my stroke. So I thought it was quite a good representation of my brain now. Now, I've just discovered there's a man in uh, America, Dr. Brendan Conroy, and he's done a lot of work with locked-in syndrome patients. And he, in his words, it renders you unable to move arms or legs, unable to speak, unable to control secretions or swallow, often without a tracheotomy, had that, a, G, a peg, had that, and communicate through eye blinks or eye rolling, Often, in, well, always incontinent, both bowel and bladder. Cognition's usually unimpaired. But I would add to the list, he said sensitivity is often unimpaired. Actually, I had severe um, sensitivity and vision. Um, emotional ability, he doesn't mention that. So I laugh at very inappropriate times <laughs> and I cry a lot. Um, leg cramps, I had horrific leg cramps. I couldn't tell anybody about, or I couldn't relieve. It was horrific. And I need to be stimulated. Yes, they were keeping me alive in ICU for nine weeks, but I was bored out of my box or with just a clock on the wall to keep me company. Now, in my words, it was like being buried alive, waking up inside your own coffin, not able to move anything, to see, hear, and think normally, but not be able to give a sign to communicate for two weeks of the five months I spent locked in. In fact, in the first two days when I was in a medically induced coma, my husband was told she'd be better off dead. Now, quite sobering. Um, what I'm going to play for you now, uh, it's pretty traumatic for all the mums out there, of which I am, but I think it really gives you an idea as to what a patient like me who is fully aware of all their faculties, everything going on around them. Um, what I was thinking 24-7, seven days a week, every day of the month, because I had nothing else to do. I mean, some of us overthink, I do, but boy, did I overthink then. And I do have to say that I didn't look my most glamorous, but you'll, 
you'll get the idea why I use the picture. It's faint, it's faint, <laughs> but the board trees and the sea ones communicate. Look into my eyes, please just look into my eyes. I'm so scared, I don't sleep, I can't sleep at night. And ow! My bloody leg cramp, please stop, no one knows about it. Just great. Can the indignity get any worse? Now, I told my mum, I started my month list. I need to hug my kids. Where are they? This separation is breaking my heart. Is Woody going to turn up? Half the angels, skins in a right mess. Dad, I've shut myself. Oh no, why in front of Rob? Why is visiting? Judging by the look on his face, it's just so bad. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Please treat me like you want to be treated yourself. I'm still me inside. Good from Kate. Oh my God, that poor man next to me has just died. I've never seen a dead body before, I'm so frightened. What the nurse is trying to kill me with that graphite drip? I've seen the film. Maybe they didn't come up with keeping. Please look into my eyes, I need help. I'm so scared, my heart is jumping out of my chest. The fear, the pain, the anxiety, the separation anxiety, the leg cramps, the hearing and seeing things, people talking over you. Um, on top of all the, uh, the worries where, they, where the tracheotomy used to just fl fl blow off uh, on its own about seven times a week, uh, any time of the day or night, which was very scary, even though there's a 24 hour nurse at the bottom of the bed, sometimes it took 10, 12 seconds to put it back on. I had a fear that what if there was a boom power cut? What if the life support stopped working? You know, I mean, all these sorts of thoughts and the hallucinations that no one warned me or my family about. You know, there's an education opportunity there, I think, especially. But I won't go into this, but it took two weeks for my friends to, who realised when I wept, when my head was pointing the door and they came to visit, I told her I had emotional ability. I used to weep silent tears. That's when they knew before the doctors that I wasn't vegetative. I was actually all there. And they cobbled together their own letterboard. But for those two weeks, knowing everything that's going on around you and not being able to give any signal at all to anybody that you weren't actually vegetative, you were new and heard everything that was going on, is pretty scary. Now, my husband, bless him, he's not here, so I can... <laughs> you're not recording this, although I am. Um, he came one day and I wanted to spell out the word leg cramp. Okay? He wasn't great at the letterboard, not many people were. I'm not great now with people I visit. So we start off at A, and I blink once for no, all the way along to L. Go back to A, blink once to E, back to A, blink once to G. Took about 20 minutes that, that's how hard work it was. And I looked at him, and he went back to A, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to have to go with this. Went all the way to C, and I blinked twice, and he said, put the board down, he said, now, Kate, you've lost your marbles. There's no such word as L-E-G-C. Well, at that point, if I could have got up and put it where the sun don't shine, <laughs> I would have done. I was, that, I was that frustrated. But to be fair, the frustration, as I'm on the other side now, I can see why he was frustrated. But moving on a little bit, I left ICU after nine weeks. I was fortunate to go to rehab at Osborne 4 in uh, Northern General. Uh, I was written off. That really fueled me from being wanting to give up. I couldn't do anything with my kids. What's the point? That's how I felt after nine weeks in ICU. Six weeks on, only six weeks, I had a review. The doctor, the neuro consultant, opened up the meeting I was in, wheelchair the headdress, dribbling like Hooch the dog, all my family. Every nurse, OT, speech and language, uh, he said, thank you all for coming. I have nothing more to add. So I was starting to blow a little bit with this emotional ability, thinking that wasn't quite what I was expecting this meeting to be about. Next one, no, no change, no significant improvement all the way through. I was really starting to blow then, getting very upset. And then the second thing, and only second thing, the consultant said was, well, we need to be discussing discharge to a nursing care home. Now, at that point, I was like, 
This wasn't the meeting to ramp up my rehab. This was the meeting to get rid of me. So I lost it. I had to be taken back to bed. And my friend got the letter board out because I was so distressed. And I wrote it in my first book that you very kindly mentioned. And I'm very proud of it. I started writing that I dare left hospital, so it's very raw and very candid and actually quite funny, bizarrely. But I spelt out the word stand by me. And she did. Um, so that moment and the fact I didn't climb Kilimanjaro via the Western Breach, which I was booked and paid for, I never got a bloody refund. What's all that about? <laughs> anyway, for my 40th, this was. So, um, and the fact that my family all went on holiday without me, it's really quite upset me. Um, fueled me to think, right, so do you all, I'm going to prove you wrong. And on my own in bed, when I had my sessions in the morning, I used to sit in bed, and I'll give you an example, I never stopped. Whether I got a little flicker in my finger, I never stopped trying to push it, or bring another one in, or move my hand from that position to that position, or that position. This side didn't move for five months, the, le the left side. And I used to sit in bed, and I'd look at my big left toe, and I'd be thinking to my, I knew nothing about neuroplasticity, but I'd be just thinking, boom, move, damn well, just move. And all the time, I was trying to, and it was so hard work, I was trying to get a movement and looking at my toe. And after about three or four weeks, I got a couple of millimetres movement, okay, that I'd done myself. So um, it was like winning the jackpot. It was amazing. Because all I could think about in my non-medic, I'm not a medic, I'm very lay, non-medic way was, if I can move that, that being the farthest from my brain, then game on for the rest of my left side. That's as simplistic as I saw things. <laughs> so from that boy in town, I was going to walk out of hospital. I did. It's on YouTube. Very, very proud of it. Very emotional. I thought I could just walk out of hospital and say, see ya. But it didn't work that way. <laughs> um, I did get home for Christmas. I did eat Christmas dinner, albeit pureed, because I had to get the, I signed a dis uh, peg removed before I left hospital. Uh, I did go upstairs to bed. They were actually sending me home to live downstairs in a room that was modified for my kitchen that I just spent 20 grand on. It's like, are you having a laugh? <laughs> no way. And um, start getting me up the stairs. I, they didn't really listen to, so I had to force the hand. But I haven't got really time to tell you that this time. But what I wanted to do was always go upstairs. They, it was assumed that to send me home downstairs was actually acceptable. Well, that wasn't what I wanted. Anyway. So, and I did run again on my first anniversary. There's a, there's a, there's a, if you go on my YouTube account, you'll see all these videos, which I took at the time because I'm a marketeer. And at the time I was thinking, this would be great motivation just for me. Didn't think about anything else I'd be doing with it. Uh, and it has been, and I did my 10-yard shuffle on the 6th of February, 2011. Just to let you know, I left hospital on the 30th of September in a wheelchair, doubly incontinent. Uh, within six weeks of the private physio who did it for free for me, um, uh, working with him, he got me onto sticks. Within another six weeks, totally off sticks, and, and I ran within three months of leaving hospital. It was incredible. And when I say ran, it was a shuffle. But just nine months after that, something else incredible happened. The moral of the story is this. Unbeknown to me, and she said, we have a problem. Kate's expectations are here, and ours are here. You need to bring Kate down to us. And she said, no, damn you, you need to go up to her. I just think that's a really important thing to stress. We talk about patient-centeredness. It's what mattered to me was very different to what matters to you, or to you, or to you, or to you. And, and what motivates us, you know, whether it's just being at home with the kids or being able to walk down the path five, ten yards to go and pick them up from school, whatever it is that drives that patient, that's the key to improving anybody with any chronic illness or any life-altering event. Um, I don't use the word recovery, I'm just going to say that now. I always use the word improvement. I've recovered, if you look at me, but I haven't. My, I've got physical issues, but emotionally I've got awful issues as a consequence of my illness, and I'm never going to be the same again. 
My family is never going to be the same again. It's a new normal. So it's not about recovery. I hate the word. It's just about improvement and being the best version of yourself. Anyway, I just wanted to ask you, just throw it out. What do you think to improving community outcomes? I think I've just given you the answer. Anybody? Shout out. What would you think is the key factor in uh, getting patients to improve their... It, well, in your opinion or my opinion, I don't care. Just give me... Anybody wants to shout out? I can do. Pardon? You wanted it. I did. You were driving it. I understand that. I understand that. We're all different. We all have different support networks, different partners. We have different families. Some families are quite readily want to pull the plug on the life support. Others will do that until they only do that if they've explored everything. Yes, we're all very different. But I guess what I'm driving at, I think it's the motivation, you know, and if there isn't any motivation, is that executive dysfunction or is that depression? Because it, how can we begin to treat somebody if we haven't dealt with the motivation? Um, another question for you. How many people do you think live with long-term disabilities? Any idea? Shout out. No one's got an idea. How many? Well, actually, it's a bit more, it's, it's, it's a bit less than that, but two and a half million of us live with long-term disabilities. When I saw that, I was quite shocked, actually. I also wanted to draw attention to, I think, language and communication really matters. I'm going to give you an example. This lady here, Steph King, she had a brainstem stroke in, with no locked-in, but in Spain. She was a big equestrian rider, young as you can see. She rang me in my charity three years ago in absolute tears because she, when she left hospital, she asked the doctor, uh, where, how long will I keep improving for? And he said, oh, you'll plateau at two years. She took him literally. She rang me up three months before her two-year anniversary in tears. Nowhere near going back on a horse, a beloved horse. And actually... That really destroyed her. That one word really destroyed her. And it's a word I really hate, actually. But um, I think the language we use really does help improve people, can potentially help. And once I'd said to her, you know, you'll never stop improving. We don't know how quickly and how far, because we're all different. We all have different injuries. But you will continue to improve. You'll continue to make little gains or big gains. You know, it's not all over just like that at two years. That's it after a stroke and I felt I had to do to educate because I'd learned that from talking to lots of other people and hearing their stories three four five six years on and how you know they can do more that they, they used to be able to do two or three years ago uh, um, take this girl as well incredible she's my heroine Christine Waddell this is gonna blow your mind she'd been in this wheelchair and a headrest for 17 years no food she had a care at home living in her own home. She used to communicate with me on Facebook. She contacted me after some media exposure about four, five, six years ago. And uh, we had a Skype conversation. Well, kind of scum conversation, if you know what I mean. And, uh, and I just said to her, Christine, move your mouth. And she went like that. And I said, I'm not being funny, but clearly nothing like your situation. But you've got more voluntary movement than I ever had. I really suffered with dysphagia, by the way. And um, I said, would you like me to try and help you work on that? And she indicated yes. I put the phone down, rang Neural Pathways, or a private neurophysio in County Durham, where she is. And I said, right, I've been in the media, so I had a bit of a, a, bit of a step up. <laughs> and I said, they knew who I was, which was a bonus. And I said, look, I've got a guinea pig. She's got no money. Just think of the kudos. If you did something with her after 17 years of nothing, no by mouth, everything else, just think if, you know, you could dine out on that as a business. Anyway, <laughs> blow me. Then he said, yeah. <laughs> and so once a week they came in. Six months. Six months she lost the headrest. That kick-started all these muscles here. And there's a theory about use it or lose it. Mm, not the case. She's, um, she's uh, built all these muscles up. She's sat on a plinth. She's able to reach forward. She's in a standing frame. She's having aqua physio. They've umped her to two days a week now, physio, um, which not only gives her weak structure, 
think of the emotional gains that she have all these people coming in having you know things to do um, I mean uh, that alone is incredible but you know what two years later they still work with her now and she's still making gains she's getting muscle tone she's back under a consultant she was discharged 19 years ago um, and he's like ah oh, this shouldn't be happening anyway she's incredibly driven even more driven than me and uh, my age actually and she sent me a, a Facebook message last Christmas and she said, Kate, you're not going to believe this. She ate her first piece of any food in 19 years and it was a big piece of chocolate cake. She's now on three meals a day. They've removed her peg. Amazing. And she's on a diet. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's incredible really. Uh, and I guess I just gave her a belief. She put in all the work, she's done everything herself, taken nothing from her and nothing from the. But with motivation, amazing things can happen. I'm going to move that. Let's get this guy here, Martin Pistorius, I mentioned him in my TEDx speech. This is another important uh, example of where we really need to understand and be sure what we're dealing with with patients because this guy for example very young he developed an, an illness he became vegetative for 10 years he was wheeled uh, you know as an old adult uh, he was wheeled in front of barney because that's what he liked when he was first ill and he absolutely hated it barney on television by the way and he knew nothing that was going on um, uh, and then a very strange thing happened after 10 years his mind came back to life um, and in that three-year period it took for his aromatherapist to realize there was something going on in his eyes he couldn't give any signal to communicate by the way in that three-year period he was physically sexually and emotionally abused by his carers and his own mother he said this himself on his own TEDx his own mother and father had so much stress with the looking after him uh, he had to listen to an argument one night where she was so exasperated and so upset that she came down to his wheelchair and she said, you should have died because he wasn't expected to live as long as he did. He's gone on to get married and he's a TEDx speaker. He's incredible. Um, this lady here really caught my attention. Social media. She was dying. And, and do you know what this incredible team of nurses did? They arranged for her beloved horse to say goodbye to her two hours it turned out before she died and can you imagine how much that would have made this this woman's quality we talk about quality of life that's quality of life in practice and for me my similar thing was I know there's health and safety issues but in absence of being able to hug my kids I wanted them to get on my bed and give me a big squeeze and that was something I really really wanted at the time um, so, I'm going to come on to a, a bit about the specific nursing now. Can we improve our patient relationships? Can we, in, in you know, consultations with patients, become more like coaches? You know, recap, you know, if a patient's coming in and talking about a problem, just to understand you really understood what the real problem is. They might have come in for a smear, but is there something behind that? You know, have you actually um, addressed maybe they've had a life-altering event or they've got other illnesses multiple illnesses and actually the smear is just a task that needs to be done they, they need to uh, you need to somehow um find okay in a way that's not going to involve them giving you their whole life story because i know you've only got a slot of a minimum amount of time but just to be aware that you're listening and your empathy and you your understanding and perhaps you know there's more to just doing the smear for example uh, that's required. Uh, it might mean that the patient doesn't come back as often. I don't know. Can we apply a few more coaching techniques to the to the uh, consultation? Um, is it worth asking if patients are taking alternative medicines? I put this in because as someone who's had a stroke and no one knows why, it kind of freaks me out a bit. So I'm thinking, I've done work on folate, I've done work on this and that and the other. But I don't know. No one's actually advised me. And I don't have any other medicines. So these are alternative therapies. Actually, I don't know whether any of these things will increase the, the thinness of my blood that I'm supposed to be on now. 
Um, you know, I'm just buying these things thinking they're good for brain health, they're good, they're going to put off me getting Alzheimer's da, 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 or another stroke. And actually, I think that's quite a, a big area to look at because I think a lot of people self, they Google what they think they need. But actually, I think it can be quite dangerous until, for example, someone told me something the other day that was taken. They said, get the research on that because actually with your condition, that's not going to be good. And that freaked me out a bit. Um, keep a patient diary. You know, it's quite nice when I go and visit the nurse to, to feel as if they at least have read two or three lines on the, on the computer before they do whatever procedure to show that they know who they're dealing with. That's really important to me. Uh, another idea, I saw a video on YouTube, it was incredible. A doctor's surgery in Australia put a video out there of when to go to the doctors and when not to go to the doctors in a really personable, friendly, buzzy way. And I thought, well, actually, that's quite a good way of communicating the services of the doctor, isn't it? The doctors or the GP surgery. Uh, could you apply some of that to your role? You know, spell out in a very... Um, modern way, you're talking about resetting the image, I'd be, loved, I'd be interested to know how you, the ideas you've got on that, but you know, start hanging out and talking where, where <coughs> the, you know, the prospective new GP nurses hang out, so you can actually get engaged with them, and that might be one way of doing it. Make it easy to book an appointment, I don't know if you've got access to that actually, but I'm just throwing it out there. 